Hi, welcome to the Toilet Paper Diaries. Today, we're going to be talking about something that affects about 75% of the population of the planet. It's called imposter syndrome, and we're going to show you how to beat it today on the Toilet Paper Diaries. Hi, Dave. How are you? It is incredible to be in episode 99. We have been uh, going on this show since uh, March 18th, 2020. My goodness. You know, I, I was, I was re registering my car today. And I couldn't remember when 2019 finished. 2020 happened and what year we're in now it's just a blur because the normal things you'd have is oh i remember doing that i remember we went on holiday and i remember we did this every day is groundhog day so it's really exciting that we've been around for that long and it wouldn't surprise me if we'd been there for another 10 years it would feel the same and we'd be just as fat so anyway it's good today's episode i think it's going to be very interesting because we have been affected by this i mean i unconsciously I have suffered from it. Even recently, I have suffered from it. And uh, I'm sure that you have also done. So, for example, in my case, I mean, and this is something that I started doing uh, out of some reflection and preparation for this episode. If I would not have had imposter syndrome, I started thinking I would have been a professional baseball player. That's one of the things that I could have done because I never believed. I mean, I was very good player, but I never believed that I was good enough to become a pro. And guess what happened? I didn't become a, a professional baseball player. Now, the second thing was that I managed to get my commercial flying license. And uh, I was one step away from becoming an airline pilot. Possibly by now, I would be flying 777s and 747s and whatever. But I never believed that I had the, what it took to become a, a professional a pilot. How has it affected you? Well, if I was to turn the clock back and look at where I was most hijacked by imposter syndrome, I think I would be a rock star. Now, that sounds like a ridiculous idea, but it's not really. I was a musician anyway. I, get, I, I went into the direction of being a DJ. I've worked with many, many rock stars on stage, and it's relatively easy to do big stadiums. But the one thing was missing was, could I have made it? And it's, you've got to do a lot of things to fall into place, but you also have to believe that you can do it. I did everything but be a pop star on the way to where I am. So I think that would have been the one that was different. Without it, I think possibly I might have just got a normal job and done normal stuff. But the imposter syndrome for me was fitting into normal life and not getting hijacked for, I don't know, uh, stereotyping and all the stuff that goes into that into that so i think that what it's given me is the ability to be closer to myself but i do know that in my career when i get close to the top table and just about ready i go oh i'll stop there and i walk away and there's yeah. so many times that's happened so the big question for everyone is how has the imposter syndrome affected uh, your life so please make sure that you keep on watching and uh, make sure to give us a like and comment and let us know exactly uh, what your thoughts are, because what you're going to be discovering on this show, it's just absolutely amazing. Imposter. Dave, why don't you tell us a little bit, possibly using some metaphors, because I know that you're great using uh, comics and uh, characters, fictional characters. Why don't you explain exactly what is the imposter syndrome for people to understand what that is? Perfect. Imposter syndrome is that belief that you're not as good as you could be. And it not only splits you into two different versions of yourself, one that's all singing, all dancing, all brilliant, but slightly darker, and one that's possibly showing you the light, but feels a little bit scared that people might find out because you're too honest, too transparent. And in many ways, that's the voices in your head saying you're not going to be able to make it, so you just don't think you can make it. From a point of view of comics and superheroes, you've got to look at the characters that are split into two sides. So often you've got somebody where they put the dark side as being the, the evil one. So, for instance, 
If you take Batman and and Bruce Wayne, which one was the imposter? I don't believe this. How could they put me at the kids' table? I'm 14. I'm Batman. No, you're not. You could be Batman. Sure. I'm Batman. See? <laughs> Is he really Batman faking himself as Bruce Wayne? Or let's take, for instance, Superman. Is he really Superman pretending to be Clark Kent? Or is he Clark Kent masquerading as Superman? Well, if you look at these two different versions, we all have two different sides to us. As to which is the strongest one and which is the one that could really make it, you will find that throughout your entire career, there's certain times that you felt really confident just being you. And you go into the zone. It could be when you're playing sports. It could be when you're doing the accounts. It could be when you're programming something. That is a real you. That's a superhero version of you. It's a bit that's not doing that. That feels like the imposter. And in many cases, your self-talk takes you down. So you never get to the high heights of what you can really do when you go in the zone. We call it being in the zone, on a roll, in the groove. So in, in other words, the uh, imposter syndrome is like if you're having your uh, negative alter ego. And we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but I mean, if we talk about uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. There he is. There's your man. A doctor, this is impossible. I know it is. But there's your man. I'm sorry, sir. You appear to be serious, but look. <gasps> The best way for you to understand this is like uh, if you watch a uh, one of those cartoons or one of these movies where you have an angel and then you have a devil in each one of your shoulders and one was telling you, you can do stuff and the other one is telling you, no, you cannot do anything because you're an idiot. And then you have like a conflict inside of your head, which is prohibiting you of actually getting that accomplished. <laughs> Excuse me, George, Jorge. How are you doing? My name is uh, Lucifer. George, don't do it. Do excuse not me, excuse, me, excuse me, I'm talking. My name is Lucifer. I'm talking right My, now. I'm introducing myself. My name is Lucifer. My friends call me Lucy. I wouldn't be surprised if we dug deep enough to see that this is actually um, driven by um, religious um, programming. And I don't mean it with disrespect to any particular, but that whole point about you shouldn't try and get above who you are because yeah. you're then going to damage everybody around you was driven in many cases by the rich landowners who wanted people to, for instance, if you take that phrase, you know, as poor as a church mouse, like it's noble to be poor, that was created by the rich landowners who owned the land where the churches were. And they told the church, the, the masters of the church, the pastors or the clerics, keep people feeling small so they don't attack us and take all our money. So I wouldn't be surprised if that imposter syndrome is generated linked to spiritual reasons. And right across the board, it happens in many, I mean, it's not many cultures, many religions, just to keep people in their place. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, if you think about it, 76.9% of all females experience imposter syndrome at one point or the other. And in the case of males, it's 76.4%. So the, the numbers are very similar. Uh, however, it is, uh, it is something that there are some people which are not uh, getting affected by this. What is very interesting is that this is a recurring problem. It's not something that it happened to you once. It happens every time. I also want to throw in education. Mm -hmm. Because all the way through your educational system, you're told you can't do that. You can only do this. You've got a constant scoring system that says you are only as good at this level. And if the only way you're graded is the traditional maths and English and sciences, but nobody teaches you how to do art or nobody teaches you how to do sports, you'll always have that imposter syndrome when you try and shift because everything tells you you're no good at stuff but you find you're good at something, but nobody believes you. So I think a lot of that conditioning starts at a very young age and works its way up. So when we're talking about how it affects it, let's talk about how it affects celebrities and pop stars then. From the minute Steve called me uh, until the minute uh, I got on set, I was certain every day that he was going to call me and tell me he'd made a mistake <laughs> you know i suffered from acute imposter syndrome like how on earth did i pull one over him to give me this role one of the best examples is neil armstrong was at an event with successful business people and creatives and he looked out over the crowd and he said these people are doing great things all i did was follow orders 
So if you take some of our, our all-time best and most decorated actors, Tom Hanks, probably the most popular actor of all time, or certain living actor of all time. Then you've got Kate Winslet, Penelope Cruz, Meryl Streep, won loads of Oscars, but feels imposter syndrome. J-Lo, Jennifer Lopez, Jodie Foster, Lady Gaga, one of the top singers uh, of all time. Serena Williams. I mean, if you go for the names, Michelle Pfeiffer, Robert Pattinson, the new Batman. All of them have felt it. Now, what I'd like to say is clearly when they go in to be vulnerable, their art allows them to dig deep into that vulnerability. And that brings out some of their very best work. So they feel it and they overcome it. But you've also got to balance it up with people who we know are in the same game, but you'd never say have got that problem. So if you compare Lady Gaga, who's, who comes across as incredibly empathetic and vulnerable, but also a huge pop star, next to Madonna, who's very similar, Madonna comes across as a, as a narcissist. As somebody, for instance, I don't know if she is, but, but certainly her career has always been, this is me, I don't care, I'm going to do it my way. And, and her successes have been built on the fact that she's reinvented herself a number of times and got over that hump yeah. of fear. Now, one of the ways that she did it, her business model, was to work with new upcoming stars as Madonna. So when a new, direct, a new producer came up with a new type of music, she'd make an album with them, like William Orbit, and she made Ray of Light, Completely great album. He gets his accolades. She gets her Grammys. And then she gets another one afterwards. So maybe piggybacking with talent is a way of getting through that. Who are the only people that uh, do not feel the imposter syndrome? Because, I, I mean, who are the only ones? <laughs> I think the ones that probably don't feel it quite so much are people who are narcissists. So they just are in denial about anything that doesn't position them as being fantastic. They just won't listen to it. And people have made a career out of deception yeah. because they probably feel it, but they don't let it out and they ignore it to the point where it's not a thing. So you're going to be looking at liars. You can look at cheats. You can talk at criminals, thieves, BS artists, and everyone can guess what BS stands for. So for instance, let's take one of the most famous cases in music and I used to look a lot like a Millie Vanilli What happened was they were on stage and they'd won Grammys. They were like the, the most loved and adored and sexiest um, double act on the planet, as far as most people, most women at least, were concerned. But then when they're playing on stage, their tape recorder got stuck. And so they couldn't sing live because it kept going, roo, roo. And it was revealed that they were faking and miming on stage. Now, many people do fake and mime, but when it came around to them recording a song with their actual voices, it was terrible. They couldn't shake it. They had to give back their Grammys that were recorded by somebody else. And after that, the shame was so embarrassing that they basically, one of them took his own life years later and the other one's got an incredibly low profile. So maybe while you're winning, it's fine. If you yeah. can get away with the murder, it's fine. But if you get caught on the downside, then the impending doom that comes with it is like imposter syndrome times whatever number that you got away with. There's several different uh, kinds of imposter syndrome. See, for example, rock stars that uh, want to get a lot of attention, a lot of adulation by the fans. Just think about how they felt throughout the pandemic. I mean, they didn't really have any attention whatsoever. So they just look at themselves in the mirror and they were definitely very much affected. In fact, if you don't have that maturity to process that, that can really affect your life. I mean, you were mentioning about the 27 year curse. So, I mean, possibly you can explain what that is because it's just yeah. shocking. Well, I mean, when you talk about the yin and yang of being a artist and an entertainer, you basically have an amplified life when you're in front of your audience and then you have to tone it down and switch it off when you're off stage. If you don't do that, you go slightly crazy. So for many comedians, people like Jim Carrey and Robin Williams uh, and Jim Belushi, 
um, they were on fire all the time. And so when you're not on stage and you're trying to make everybody laugh, eventually people just don't laugh so much. So then you get depressed because you're not having such an impact. And so that's a real challenge for comedians, for any artist or any speaker or any entertainer. You need to have that ecosystem built up for you, waiting for the opportunity to go out in front of an audience and get that applause. It's addictive. And if you don't get it, then you start doubting yourself. That's why so many people were going on Facebook Live and just doing anything. For you and I, we found an outlet doing this show. So we yeah. could still present, we could still perform. But in the history of, of, of music, for instance, there have been a number of people who didn't make it past that whole situation. And the magic number for, for that depression, catching up with the talent, catching up with the need to evolve and maybe not making it because of the fact that you'd gone so far down, you own a rabbit hole. You've got to look at people like James Dean, died at 27, Jimi Hendrix, 27, Amy Winehouse, 27, Kurt Cobain from Nirvana, 27. You look at Janis Joplin, all these stars all passed at 27. It's like a curse that affects entertainers. Why it happens at that age, I don't know, but certainly what happened to them, we can all appreciate. Anyone who thinks 13 is the unluckiest number should take a closer look at 27. Once you realize just how many celebrities have died at that age, it starts to get a little distressing. You can't handle the truth. Let's say that you were a general, let's say that you were a lieutenant or a colonel or a sergeant major, whatever your rank is, not only on the military, but also if you were the president of the company or the CEO, and then you, you retire, you start also having these feelings. So this is also something interesting to keep in mind. I told you if you were ever a shrimp boat captain, that I'd be your first mate. Well, here I am. I am a man of my word. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but don't you be thinking that I'm going to be calling you sir. No, sir. Make sure to share this video with other people. So what we're going to do now is we're going to be giving you six signs that, that you might be experiencing the uh, imposter syndrome and also the antidotes. Just before we jump in, I want to share with you a fact that I studied years ago. I started studying how to be a lie detector to tell whether people are lying or not. And this fits into the imposter syndrome thing. For anybody who's ever watched that show, Lie to Me, starring Tim Roth, which is a great series about a guy who works for the police whose job is to see whether somebody's lying. I studied that actual uh, um, skill and I found it was really difficult to be able to learn to tell if somebody's a liar. Everyone's 50%, doesn't matter how good you are, you're 50%, they got 50-50, toss a coin, guess if they're lying or not, you're probably wrong. The only people who are excellent at doing it are criminals and policemen. Everybody else has no clue what's going on. So you may not even know that you're lying or people around you are lying about it because it's so in-depth and it's so covered up by everybody. So let's look at the ways that people do see imposter syndrome, the signs, and then we'll suggest some ways of being able to fix it. So let's start with the first one. Got to ask a question. Do I experience self-doubt regularly? So that's a huge issue for, for many people. Part of our conditioning now, especially uh, post-COVID, is to ask ourselves questions about our mental and emotional health and to really check to see how we're doing to create a relationship internally before we share it with the outside world. Now, imposter syndrome, that's partly it. The solution to that is what? Do it anyway. Absolutely. Go out, do it anyway, and you'll get over any self-doubt you have. What other examples have you got, Ernesto? Number two is going to be, are you a perfectionist or are you a procrastinator? And I think these ones always go together. Oh, I have to make it perfect. I have to make it perfect. This is a clear issue that you are facing imposter syndrome because of course you want to make it perfect so that nobody will say that you're an imposter that you're a fake that you're a fluke that could really affect people in actually having progress and that's why you procrastinate i mean uh, you can see so many different videos here in youtube on uh, ted and on different ted talks that are talking about procrastination and every single one of them is actually going into in, into being perfect so the important thing is not to focus on perfection. That's the antidote. Don't focus on perfection, focus on progress. So you need to make sure that you're actually going further little by little. I mean, you're, it's not going to be perfect at the beginning. You start doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it until you have it uh, really nice. So focus more into progress than into perfection. 
Absolutely. When it comes to goal setting, rather than thinking, oh, I've got to get this, focus on how you get there, understand the process. And that means you can reproduce it at any given time. So you might not be a perfectionist, but you're certainly a winner and a practitioner, which is what you really need. I'd say number three on this is a question saying, are you afraid of being exposed as a fake by people. So people are going to notice and somebody's going to call you out, just like we said about Millie Vanilli, and say you're not everything that you think you are. Now, everybody feels that at some point, from the point of whether it's built in society, you, you drive into the wrong part of town and you're suddenly stared at, you go into the wrong shop, you go into the wrong meeting, all these different things. We've all experienced being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And the key to it is to act as if you are fine with it, and you will become at doing it. So remember that phrase, act as if you are. Yeah. That way you're hijacking the way your subconscious mind works. So rather than filling it with the programming that says, I'm not right there here, there's negative stuff. It goes, no, we're fine. It goes, really? Yeah, okay, well, let's notice things that make that a truth. And before you know it, you do become that thing. So when you want to start a new career, Start acting as if that's your existing career, and suddenly you'll start filling the gaps very, very quickly, consciously and subconsciously. Many people or many gurus even tell you, you know, you have to fake it till you make it. Now, what's the problem with that specific wording that you're including the word fake it? So then you immediately are actually feeding the fact that you are a fake. The moment that you actually act as if, That just changes completely in your brain this way of thinking. So that's an important remark for you to have. Faking until you make it worked when nobody was watching. Um, the problem is so many of you now are saying you're there before you're there. Think about trying to scare yourself by going boo. You know it's going to happen because you've got to say boo. Oh, it's me. Same as if you give yourself programming. I'm a fake, but I'm going to be okay. In the back of your head, you're still saying I'm a fake. That's yeah. why it doesn't work. Sign number four, it's going to be, are you afraid of failing? The easiest way to deal with the fear of failure is to be more fearful of not taking action, to be more fearful of settling for a life that is far below what you deserve and what you desire. The imposter syndrome is just a bump on the road. It's not something, it's not a wall, it's just a bump on the road that you have to go across. So if you're afraid of failure, what you need to do is you have to do it until, until, until and that's the important word i mean jim ron always said whenever things are not working the way you want to do them you have to do it until they work and that is actually the antidote for number four i asked the kids how long should a baby try to learn how to walk how long would you give your average baby before you say hey enough enough no any mother in the world would say you're crazy my baby is going to keep trying what until what a magic word i want you to write it down until Number five, do you feel that you need to be the best? Is that what's going on in your head all the time? I know people, again, who are perfectionists, needing to score points, needing to be better than everybody else. People who start getting really upset with themselves if they lose at cards, or even if they, they're running, or even if walking, I mean, not walking fast enough so they get to the, the, queue, the, the front of the queue. If they're at the back of the queue or second in the queue, they're beating themselves up because they're constantly competitive. Now, it's hard to be the best at everything, But here's the thing, the human race is not about being the best because at some point in the next hundred years, you and I won't be here anymore, Esther. Maybe before that, you never know. And yeah. nobody's going to care the fact that we'll still watch your toilet paper diaries and we'll be treated like Bill, uh, Bill and Ted. And we'll go, hey, Ernesto, Dave, we got all your records. But the thing is, what was said by Oscar Wilde is be yourself because everybody else is taken. Yeah. So don't compare yourself to anybody else. Just be the best version of you and what you get as results out of your life are never going to be like anybody else's because they don't have the same experiences, the same talent, the same world or the same views as you or the same need to do the same stuff as you. Stop comparing yourself to other people. You're only on this planet to be you. Albert Einstein had also a very interesting observation. He says, well, you know, if you judge a fish by his ability of climbing trees, he will always feel that he's an idiot, the poor fish. Your life journey is about learning to become more of who you are and fulfilling the highest, truest expression of yourself as a human being. That's why you're here. Uh, the next and the, the very last one here is, do you 
unconsciously self-sabotage. <laughs> In my opinion, there's two types of people in this world. Those who self-sabotage and those are in denial that they self-sabotage. Part of the way to move forward with this is to start designing your own life, your own personal brand, working out who you are, who you don't want to be, looking what other people think of you, and then deciding how much you want to change to make that happen. Um, once you are in charge of your own ego and presentation and brand and direction, then the only person that can change it is you and how you react to things that happen around you and drive what happens next. Feeling like an imposter is a sign of professional or personal growth. Remember that saying, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room? This is exactly what I'm talking about. If you reframe your perception of the imposter syndrome this way, not only it becomes more manageable, but it also becomes empowering because you stop being a victim of imposter syndrome, but you start owning the situation. You start purposefully exposing yourself to challenges. So first, do some reframing work with yourself. Stop being a victim and start being in control. The Hedgehog concept was uh, created by um, Jim Collins in his amazing books, uh, Good to Great and Built to Last. So we have a look at the diagram of a hedgehog. I mean, you know what a hedgehog is. It's a porcupine. Basically, and when it's in danger, it curls up into a ball with its spikes on the outside. And that way it can stop any natural predators getting to it. And what you've got to do is work out what you do naturally so you're brilliant at doing it and what you what you want to do forever. So there's three elements that go into this, uh, this Venn diagram. First one is what are you potentially the best in the world at doing so you can turn around with good bragging rights and say, leave it to me, I'll take care of it. The next thing is uh, what are you actually passionate about so you love doing it and you never get bored. And the third thing is what will the world pay for? Not what does the world need, but what does the world want? What will it pay for? And somewhere between those three circles, what you're brilliant at, what you love, and what people will pay for is your own personal hedgehog. And when you do that, it means you're in your zone all the time. So the imposter syndrome will only be when you take that hedgehog to a new place. But when you arrive, you're on a roll because you're already doing what you do really well. And that's a really powerful way to start driving the rest of your business. And it never gets taught at school. And I think that everybody should know it. Now, here's the thing that I found really powerful. And we're going to mention this amongst other techniques. Vision boards are great because ultimately they're creating goals. But what's more powerful than goals is to learn business models of how to reverse engineer those levels of success. Yeah. So rather than tr saying one day I want to live in this house, I want to drive that car, I'd love to go on holiday here, work out if you go there, what is the business model you have to adopt to be able to make that happen and just make your vision board full of business models. That way you can have those things really whenever you want them. I guess it comes down to a simple choice, really. Get busy living, you get busy dying. I have to find some ammunition to actually fight my negative alter ego. And the best way to do that is to actually show him evidence that I have done great things. So every time that I'm going to get started with something, what I will do is I will remind myself of stuff that I have done in the past so that whenever I get that feeling of, no, I cannot do it, I am really afraid of whatever doing it, then I can just show it, show it to my alternative alter ego and, of course, pull through uh, whenever the uh, imposter syndrome hits me. <laughs> so it sounds a little bit bonkers about talking to yourself, but self-talk is driving most of whole, this whole experience. Yeah. So when you find it, your brain says to you, you can't do it. You've got to turn around and counter it and says, who says I can't? You say I can't or, or I say I can't or other people say that's yeah. their problem. I can do this. And 
what really works well is looking at other people who have done it. Now, they might not have done what you're aiming for, but they went for a similar challenge in their own particular life. And if you work out how they worked it out, then you can apply that. So, for instance, a, a wheel is round. So if you're going to take a wheel and put it from a car onto a different instrument, a trolley, then it's still going to be a round wheel, even if it's on a different vehicle. So you can cut and paste people's success from them being practitioners in something and use those different ideas for yourself. Whenever I feel low, whenever I'm feeling that I, I am doubtful or whatever, I mean, I have good friends of Dave. And uh, I mean, I get in touch with him and he's always very supportive. I am also very supportive of him. My, my wife, the same thing. Whenever I feel that I cannot do something, I mean, I just express it. This is one of those things which is very important. Whenever you're feeling this, express it to people, to people that care about you. And they will help you push through that bump. Remember, it's a bump. It's not a wall. And that I think it's also very important. Absolutely. But to get the best effects, sometimes you need to have a professional relationship with somebody, yeah. somebody you can hold accountable. So if they don't, with your family and friends, they're great for, for cushioning the blow and giving you a hug, even if it's a virtual hug. But if you really want to get special results, do the work, invest, get yourself a mentor or a coach who's been there, done it or can work out the business model with you because then you can hold them accountable. If they don't do the job, you can get rid of them. But if they do do the job, you know that you'll fast track your way to get there. It's very powerful. And one of the things that you and I have done, and we've done it all the way through the toilet paper diaries. We did it. We've done it for, we've known each other for over 20 years. Have a sense of humor, yeah. laugh at everything. It's great stress management. It allows you to be able to just go, you know what? Things have happened all the time. Things go bad. If you look at the biggest stars on the planet, whether you talk about guys like Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg or even Steve Jobs, look at their history and things messed up many times for them. Look at the biggest movie stars. How many of them had flop movies? Pop stars, how many had a bad album? Take, for instance, Prince. Prince was probably one of the most prolific artists of all time. In fact, when he passed away, they found 15,000 songs unreleased. But a lot of his work wasn't loved by people. It was a bit weird or they didn't quite get it. Doesn't matter. You still continue to do it because that's what makes you a superstar. A great example is, uh, as you were saying, the toilet paper diaries. I mean, we went into a completely unknown territory and we thought that it was going to possibly last for a month. Ended up lasting 14, 15, 16 months. We are not yet in the other side of it. I mean, we're almost there, but we're not yet completely yep. on the side of it. And I think one of the things that really helped us besides eating, because I gained 12 kilos out of it, it was having a sense of humor. I mean, we were on a daily basis. We were trying to bring a sense of humor to people. We were laughing about the whole thing. And if you think about it, this entire show has been incredibly therapeutic for, for, uh, for ourselves, but also for the people that have watched the show. So I think, uh, I think that's just incredibly important. I mean, Things are going to happen and you're going to be confronted. So instead of actually taking it with fear, take it, take the philosophy. Okay, well, I'm going to try it. I'm going to give it a try two or three times. Let's see how it all works. And I'm going to try it until so that you can actually pull through. Remember, it's a bump, not a wall. Absolutely. And the great thing about having a sense of humor is sometimes you need to burst a bubble and get rid of that tension. So if you can laugh at it, the endorphins kick in. It means that all the pressure just disappears for a short amount of time. And that puts you in a position where you can actually do something about it. And that's one of the reasons that we've worked together so well for many years is literally because we can both look at each other, crack up laughing, and suddenly the, the, the big problem just disappears. <laughs> So next, I would say that enjoy the journey, enjoy the adventure. It's not just about chasing the end goal. If it was only about the end goal, in many cases, you could buy it or you could associate with people who've done it and fake it. So it's about the experience. It's about every day. What did you have to do to get from there to here and then keep going and the things that went wrong and the things that went right? 
If you think about everything, including the hero's journey and the way that Hollywood stories are written about the, the guy who starts off with a big challenge ahead of them, they've got to learn stuff, they've got to get a mentor, they're never going to be able to make it, they've got to go into wilderness and get things wrong, get things right, get laughed at, and then they get in, they step up, they get to where they need to be, and then things go wrong again, they drag themselves up, and then they finally triumph. That is a story that takes up 99% of Hollywood movies. And why? Because we love it. We love the underdog story. Guess what? You're the underdog. Congratulations. You're the star of your own movie and you're in it. And it's never about the end result. If you watch a film, you see the closing credits. What's the point? It's the way you get there is what the emotional turmoil and challenge and euphoria is ultimately all about. All right, I'll give it a try. No. Try not. Do. Or do not. There is no try. Get ready because we are closing 100 episodes next time. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, get busy, go for it. That's the important thing. I'm going to ask you a question, Ernesto, before you finish your show. When we first started broadcasting with Toilet Paper Diaries, we were definitely imposters in the TV world. We had no clue really what we were doing. We'd done TV shows before, but never at the scale and never the live broadcasts and everything that's gone with it. Now at 99 shows, do you feel an imposter about live streaming your show? Not anymore. I, I feel incredibly confident and I, I feel an expert. And right now what happens is I start seeing things in a very different way because now I see what other people do and I know the quality of what we do and it's a completely different story. So we were not the only ones that got started with, uh, with doing broadcasts on a daily basis. How many people lasted for this long? <laughs> There's not one single person, guru, expert, whatever you want to call it, that has gone all the way. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's your stickability and your ability to get to the finishing line is going to be the ones that make it versus talent versus insights versus everything else. There's a thing we did a show about called grit. Ultimately, if you've got the grit, you'll get what you want out of life. You and can that's see why grit we're heading here. Forward. It's just appearing right now on the screen. <laughs> there you go. Wonderful. See, it just proves it's true. So with that grit, we're reaching a hundred episodes, Ernesto. I can't wait for that. Yeah, um, we won't be imposters anymore. We'll be there to prove it can be done. And it's time to change the model. I mean, we finished the 100, and now we're going to be changing the model, and we're going to be telling you a little bit more about it very soon. So until episode 100, I hope that you have a fantastic day. <laughs>